الديار تبارك الديار تبارك الديار تبارك الديار تبارك الديار الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The topic of this presentation to plan or not to plan addresses a philosophical question which is in fact a part and parcel of our belief system. If we believe in destiny where is the room for planning should we not just trust in Allah trust in God and be spontaneous just dealing with things as they come since everything is already written some mystics and philosophers even argue that the attribute in Arabic known as tadbir or planning is one of the attributes of Allah and some include it amongst his names for example you find in the 32nd chapter of the Quran verse 5 yudabbiru al-amra min as-sama'i ila al-ard he plans the affairs from the heavens to the earth so they argue that planning should really be left to him. Just as he describes himself as being Al-Ilah, the one who is worshipped, and we leave worship for him alone. Also he describes himself as a samad the one on whom all things depend. So we depend on him. We don't put ourselves in that situation where everybody depends on us. Al-Qayyum is the self-sufficient. Al-Muhyi is the giver of life. And all these attributes which we know belong only to God. We cannot take these attributes on ourselves. So this is a philosophical debate and discussion which some have held. However, in real life, people plan. Even if it's just to go to the supermarket to get our food, we make a list. We plan out what it is we, we're going there for and we buy in accordance with that list. Similarly, when we look at the creation of businesses, starting companies, constructing buildings, uh, designing airplanes, cars, ships, etc., all of these, without a doubt, require planning. If we were to try to do any of these without planning, we got people together to build a bridge and then everybody just did their own thing, however they felt, what would we end up with? Chaos. A bridge which the first person that got in it would be falling into the river. So we know in real life that planning is necessary. So much so that the people in the management field developed this phrase, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. If you fail to plan, in fact, you're dooming yourself to failure. And they've pointed out that in the case of planning where objectives are achieved through planning, what you find is that 80% of the efforts will produce 20% of the results if there's no planning, but if there is planning, instead it becomes the opposite. 20% of our efforts produces 80% of the results. So there is great benefit in planning without a doubt. If we only react to circumstances as they arise, then we are doomed to responding to various circumstances in our lives in a very unsystematic way. It will be a chaotic way. That is the conclusion. Now, 
as Muslims, we have to ask the question because Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he was the best of examples for us. Allah describes him in the Quran saying, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا There is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best of examples. So this philosophical question and the practical things that we have to deal with, we conclude what we have to do really by looking to see what did he do? What did Prophet Muhammad wasallam do? Did he plan or did he just take things as they came? Reality, when we look at his life, we see careful, meticulous planning. For example, when he had to make the hijrah, when he emigrated from Mecca to Medina, how did he do it? Did he just pick up one night and just take off and... No. He planned it out, the route, the uh, people who would supply them on the way, uh, he got a guide, he left somebody in his home, Ali ibn Abi Talib in his home, so that they would think he was still in the house. I mean, there was careful planning. If we look, for example, at the Battle of Uhud, we can find in there all kinds of examples of planning. He, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, kept his uncle, Al-Abbas in Mecca, Muslim, but externally, people thought he was a non-Muslim. So he would gather information and feed that information back to the Prophet and his followers in Medina to protect them from any harm that they may, uh, may happen to them as a result of Meccan uh, efforts to destroy Islam. So when the Meccans decided they were going to attack Medina, Al-Abbas informed the Prophet. Prophet ﷺ, this is part of the planning. He left somebody there in place to keep giving them information. When he heard it, then he gathered together the companions to decide what are they going to do? How are they going to meet these people who are coming? Militarily, should we fight them inside the city or should we fight them outside the city? They got together and they decided on what, what route to take. He personally wanted to fight them from inside the city, but they all wanted to fight them outside the city saying, you know, we want to show them, you know, that we are brave, etc. You know, we, we, fighting inside the city is like sneaky. No, we want to face them on the battlefield. So the Prophet, knowing that the better route really was inside the city, still went along with their uh, decision because he wanted to train them also in collective decisions. Anyway, the point is that we find in all of the various circumstances of the Prophet's life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, we find in it planning taking place. And the biggest example that uh, is usually raised to clarify this point is the occasion when the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, was sitting in the mosque and an individual came in to join him. But just before he sat down, he remembered he had not tied up his camel outside of the mosque. So he stopped and thought for a minute, well, should I trust in God or should I go out and tie my camel? So he asked the Prophet, what should I do? Should I trust in Allah or should I tie my camel? Why is it so important people who have never lived around camels can't grasp? Because say for example here in North America, we don't have camels, we have horses. And a horse, if you raise a horse from it is born till it becomes, you know, uh, an adult, that horse becomes a partner to you to such a degree, wherever you go, he'll follow you. He attaches himself to you. And so is the case of most domesticated animals. However, the camel is completely different. The camel, if you raise that camel from the time it is born, and you give it an opportunity to escape, it will take it. First opportunity, it's gone. As if it never knew you, you never raised it, you never fed it, just takes off. Like a wild animal. And of course, we can laugh about it, but if you're out on the desert, that's a big problem. You let your camel go, and that's it. 
This is why they develop special techniques to keep the camel under control. The black band that you see Arabs commonly wearing around their headscarf, they have a headscarf and they have this black band, it's called the iqal. This is specifically for tying the camel. Most people don't know that. They think it's just a stylistic thing, you know. But really, actually it was for tying the camel. It opens up into a big hoop, which they twist, make it, put it together, makes a double uh, hoop, and they put it on their head. What they, need, what they do, if they're out on the desert, they will bend the camel's knee and put this hoop of rope around the knee. So he's standing on three legs. If he wants to move, he can only hop a little bit. He can't run away. So of course, after they did that, you got back on your camel, you had to ride away in the sunset, you know, wind blowing through your headscarf, your gutra. What better place to put that hobbling cord but on your head to keep the gutra on your head so it wouldn't fly away, right? So, this was the strategy. So when this person asked the Prophet ﷺ this question, he asked him a question which was serious. It wasn't just a frivolous question. So the Prophet ﷺ turned to him and said, Aqilha wa tawakkal. Tie the camel and then trust in Allah. That's the basic principle. Tie the camel means you do all your planning, you do what is necessary to get this job done. Then after you've done all you could, then you leave your affairs to God. But it's after you've made your effort, not before. So this is the correct methodology. And furthermore, when we consider that original argument that tadbir or this planning is one of the attributes of God, in fact, there are a number of different attributes of God which we are expected to emulate. There are some which we're not which I mentioned earlier. But there are others which we are. For example, mercy, kindness. When Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, on one occasion, he kissed his uh, grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. he kissed them. And one of the other companions saw him doing it. He turned to the others and said, oh, I have 10 kids and I've never kissed one of them. You know, he felt this was like, Manhood, right? Men don't kiss kids. Right? So, when the Prophet heard that, he turned to him and said, Man la yarham, la yurham. Whoever doesn't show mercy, will not receive mercy from God. So, this was an attribute of God which we are expected to emulate, to express in our lives. Similarly, many of the other attributes. So, the planning, it is not against the principle of uh, knowing Allah's names and His attributes and applying them in our lives. So, we can conclude from that, that planning is important. It means that as Muslims, we have to put plans in our lives if we are to be successful. This was the way of the Prophet wasallam. Now planning is generally defined as the process of setting goals, developing strategies, and outlining tasks and schedules to accomplish those goals. So we're talking about setting goals first and foremost. Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, gave us guidelines for setting goals. He said in a hadith, Authentic hadith. Man kanat dunya hamma, farraq Allahu alayhi amra, wa ja'ala faqrahu bayna aynayh, wa lam ya'tihi min ad-dunya illa ma kutiba lah. Whoever's greatest concern, whoever's goal is this world, Allah will scatter his affairs and place poverty between his eyes, and nothing will come to him from this world except what was origi originally written for him. Whoever makes this world his goal. His affairs will be scattered. 
He'll be like a chicken without a head. Running from here to there, trying to get some of this and some of that, and never satisfied. He's all God. He's, as the Prophet said, if you give the son of Adam a valley of gold, he would want another one. There's no end to desire. The, gre- the grass is always greener on the other side. So he's running from here, always looking for that greener grass. Can't be settled, can't be at peace. Just running around like a madman. His affairs are scattered. That is the consequence. Furthermore, Allah puts poverty between his eyes. What does this mean? Means that no matter what he has, he will still look at poverty as his greatest enemy. So people who smile at him, instead of taking it the nice way, oh, person is happy with me, they smile at me, let me smile back at them, they say, ah, what does he want? They probably want some of my money. So he'll be suspicious of everybody. And there was a case about three months ago in the newspapers recorded about a German industrialist. This man in his late 70s was the 47th richest man on the face of the earth, according to worldly standards. Wealth. He had 14 billion dollars. Or maybe it was euros. German. 14 billion of it. Anyway, when the financial crisis hit Germany, as it hit everywhere else, starting in America, it reached Germany. It hit them and hit him heavily. In one week, he lost nine billion dollars. In one week, he lost nine billion dollars. So, what did this senior citizen do? Killed himself. He committed suicide. We would ask, what about the five billion? You lost nine, you still got five left. The loss of the nine was so great, he couldn't see the five billion. Who can spend five billion dollars? <laughs> I mean, five billion dollars is just something we can't even imagine. But this man, in spite of having five billion dollars remaining, took his life. Poverty was between his eyes. He couldn't appreciate what he had. And why? Because this world was his gold. This was his goal. Everything was focused on this world. So any loss in this world becomes devastating. We have all these cases of people. They have this one they call the postman syndrome. People working in the post offices back in uh, the late 90s. One man lost his job, he went home, he bought, got himself a clashing cov, came back into the office and started mowing down people in the office. And then another person lost their job in a post office again. It's about five cases, one after the other in the States, people came into their, their offices after losing their jobs and killed their workmates. So they call it the post office or postmaster syndrome. But what was it about? It was about this thing of poverty. This world becomes so valuable, so treasured, that loss causes people to fall apart. And in reality, in the end, no matter what they do, they will only get from this world what God has already written for them. So then what's the option? The Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, وَمَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ نِيَةً جَمَعَ اللَّهُ لَهُ أَمْرَةً وَجَعَلَ غِنَاهُ فِي قَلْبِهِ وَأَتَتْهُ الدُّنْيَا وَهِيَ رَاغِمَةً Whoever places the next world as his intention, whoever makes the next world his or her intention, Allah will gather their affairs. They will not be running all over the place. They make their effort and they're satisfied. 
There is a calmness that's in their lives. And Allah will put wealth, richness in their hearts. Richness in their hearts meaning contentment. That they will be contented with what happens after making their efforts. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى مِنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرَضِ That wealth and richness is not from having a lot of commodities. لَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ True wealth is wealth of the soul. Where the soul finds peace, contentment, and rest. And that only happens when a person makes the life to come, the hereafter, their real goal. Looking beyond the things of this life. Understanding that this is only a bridge. And furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, the world will come to him or her submissively. They will not have to chase it, it will come. Opportunities will present themselves. And they take from it what is necessary. So, this is the starting point in planning to put our goals in order. Of course, when you ask the average Muslim, what's your goal in life? They say, paradise. They'll say, it's clear, we know, it's paradise. However, when you look into their lives, you listen to what they speak about, what they read about, what occupies all of their time. It's all about the dunya. They talk about houses, cars, vacation, all of the things related only to the accumulation of wealth and its enjoyment. So we say, how can that be? How can your goal be the akhirah and you don't talk about it? It doesn't really enter into your life. So, we can judge ourselves that way. We can just stop for a minute and ask ourselves, what do I spend most of my day talking about? Thinking about? If it's not about the life to come, the consequences of our actions and where it leads, then we have to say in reality, our goal is not the life to come, but this life. In order to achieve those goals, we also have to determine the prerequisites for those goals. What do we need to do to achieve this goal of paradise? The basic prerequisite which God has revealed to His creatures is Islam. A way of life which He revealed to Adam and Eve, the first human beings on the earth, and all of the prophets brought that same message of Islam, submission to the will of God, to humankind. That way of life, that is the prerequisite to achieve the goal in the hereafter. And one has to be clear about that way of life. That Islam that we're speaking about is not Islam that we may find in many communities today, which we really should call cultural Islam. A result of cultural, local practices in different parts of the Muslim world, where people have a tradition which is so mixed up and confused, you can't really even be sure what is Islam and what is culture. This is what has happened to much of the Muslim world today. And that's why you find certain practices amongst Muslims, which non-Muslims look at and say, oh, what kind of religion is this? Like, for example, honor killing. We find it in Pakistan, we find it in Jordan, you know, where the family feels that uh, one of the girls, usually it's girls, have dishonored the family by developing some kind of relationship outside of marriage. So, what is the solution? Purify the honor of the family, her brother, her father, her uncle, whatever, agrees and takes her life. It's called, in those areas, honor killing. But the reality is that there is no honor in killing. In Islam, there's no such thing as honor killing. That's just plain murder. And the consequence for it should be death. 
However, in these areas, because of the fact that they're not applying Islamic law, they take into account these tribal and uh, national customs, and they only will punish the person. They're saying that they're agreeing it's not right, but they will only punish them by a few years in jail. So one of the family members, he makes that sacrifice. I'll be the one. I'll do it. I'll spend the two years in jail to purify the honor of the family. But this is evil. And this is now associated with Islam and Muslims. But in fact, it isn't. So what we're talking about is true Islam. The Islam which was brought in its final form by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The one which was understood by his generation. As they implemented it, they understood what it meant. That is the true Islam that is the prerequisite for achieving paradise in the life to come. And so, when we look at Islam, of course it's a large system involving every aspect of human life. So where do we start? The next step is that we have to prioritize. We have to set some priorities. Because there's so many things to do. So number one priority for a Muslim is to practice the pillars of Islam. That is number one priority. And if he or she fulfills that properly, then they have done what is basically required of them. We know that because a man came to the Prophet, a Bedouin came to the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him about it. What do I need to do? And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, explained to him what he needed to do. And each time he would explain to him, prayer, you've got five times daily prayer. And then there is voluntary prayers that you can also do in between, etc. He said, no, no, I'll just do the required, the obligatory. He said, okay, he'd go on to the next thing. And each time he would explain to him the voluntary acts of worship, he would say, oh, thank you, but I'll just stick with this one. At the end of it all, he said, I'm not going to do any more or any less. And when he turned and walked away, the Prophet said to his companions, the rest of the companions there, this man will enter paradise if he's truthful. If he does that, as required of him, he is guaranteed paradise. But of course, when we say doing it, doing the prayer, for example, we have five times daily prayer. It's not any five times daily prayer, but it is prayer according to the way of the Prophet. May God's peace and blessing be upon him. He told us, Sallu kamar aytumuni usalli. Pray as you saw me pray. So it's not just anyhow, any way. It's supposed to be prayer where the heart is fully involved. It's not just an external action that we go through like calisthenics or a kata in, in karate or something like this. We just do the movements. No. It is supposed to be fundamentally an internal communication with God in which we are worshipping Him in the way which the Messenger of God has taught us. Similarly for Hajj, the Prophet had said, خُذُوا anni manasikakum." Take your rights of Hajj from me. He showed the way. So it's not just any Hajj. And we don't make excuses for not doing Hajj. Some people say, well, you know, if you have a daughter who isn't married, your first obligation is to get her married. You don't do Hajj until you get your daughter married. No, this is, this is not a condition in Islam. It's never put there. Some people say, don't do Hajj if you're young. A young person says, I want to do Hajj. They say, no, 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 no. Hajj, when you go to make Hajj, Hajj purifies your sins. You're still young. Still got a lot of sins to do. So better to wait until you, you know, reach that age. You've got a white beard. You've run out of steam. You can't do any more sins. Now you go to Hajj. Right? And then we wonder why we hear about so many people every year going for Hajj dying. The number is dying. People think, oh, it's the Saudi officials. They're not organizing things properly. No. It's many old people who left Hajj until the last years of their lives. And what happens there? 
Of course, when you go there with the wrong intention, you have delayed Hajj till you've run out of steam. Are you going to have the proper morals and character necessary for Hajj? No. And this is why, you know, anybody who goes to make Hajj, you'll find yourself shocked. You're making toe off, you accidentally step on somebody's foot. You see this old man with a big long beard, he goes, bang! You know, he knocks you, ah! Oh, why? Step on my foot! You know. People fighting in Hajj, you know, old people, you say, Father, Grandpa, Uncle, take it easy, it's Hajj. <laughs> they can't see it. They're just reacting to whatever comes. Because Hajj, for Hajj to be purifying, one has to have prepared himself or herself for Hajj. We had to have lived lives where we are morally guided, trying to do the right thing, preparing ourselves, then we can do the kind of Hajj which Islam prescribes. After that, in our prioritization, we have to fulfill the various obligations which are on us. Outside of the five pillars, then we have obligations which govern different aspects of our lives. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said, "Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati." Each and every one of you is a shepherd responsible for his flock. We have a responsibility as fathers and mothers. We have a responsibility to raise our families Islamically. As the father, we have a responsibility to make sure that the home is an Islamic home. So we have to plan for this. How do you plan for it? It means that if you're going to choose a husband or a wife, your criterion shouldn't be movie star. Right? It shouldn't be movie star. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, people are married for a variety of reasons. For their beauty, for their wealth, for their family status, etc. But choose piety and you'll be successful. So if we want to raise righteous Muslim children, then we have to start with righteous Muslim parents. If we're not righteous Muslim parents, how can we expect to raise righteous Muslim children? So we as parents, future parents, have to plan and do the necessary steps to fulfill what is required for the raising of righteous Muslim children. So among those things is an Islamic environment, home environment. The family has the right to that. The father, it is your obligation to ensure that there is an Islamic environment in the home. Secondly, when there are children, it is the right of Muslim children to receive Islamic education, an Islamized education, meaning that Muslim children are supposed to go to Muslim schools. Meaning that it is fundamentally haram for us to put our children in non-Muslim schools. People might say, oh, you've gone to an extreme, that's too much. No, it is haram. It is not permissible unless a person has no other options. You are forced. And we say even if you are forced, then teach them at home. And if you can't, that's, you can do so much, you do as much as you can. But the idea of putting Muslim children in non-Muslim schools is spiritual suicide. That's what it is. Spiritual suicide. And this is the, and this is the big challenge that the Muslim community here in Toronto is faced with. Many of the Muslim schools don't even have enough 
students to be able to balance the budget. Most people, most young people are not going to Muslim schools. And this is a major crime. And the sin of it falls on the community as a whole. Those who have the means and the ability to correct it and do not, they carry the major sin. Those who don't have the means and the ability, then of course Allah is most merciful. But this is an obligation to develop alternative schools to ensure that the generation which is coming up comes up conscious of Allah. Conscious of Islam, righteous Muslims with correct morals, at the same time, educated. I'm not saying create madrasas where you're only teaching Islamic. No, no. It should be modern international type schools where Islam is taught and all the other subjects are taught, but everything is from an Islamic perspective. That is the right of our children to receive that. In the end, in closing, the last principle for planning that we have to keep in mind is that we have to set a time frame. We don't have all the time in the world. And that's why Prophet Muhammad had said, Ni'matani maghboonun fihi ma kathiru min nas There are two blessings from God that most people are deluded about. As-sihhatu wal faragh Good health, and spare time. We have to realize that there really is no such thing for a Muslim as spare time. We don't have time to kill, as they say. No. Every minute counts. Every second that goes by is a second lost. So as a Muslim, we have to manage our time wisely. We will be asked on the Day of Judgment about our time and how we spent it. So, this is the summary of what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. That planning is an obligation on us. If we are to successfully leave this life to a greater success, in the next. I ask Allah to give us the realization and the importance of planning and to prepare ourselves properly for the hereafter. To dedicate ourselves to Islam and to fulfill our responsibilities in a systematic and planned way. Barakallah fikum. May Allah bless you all and Keep me in your prayers as I keep you in mind. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.